All right. Hey, guys, and welcome back. In our lecture today, we will be talking about the election of 1800 and the beginning of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. So I'm very excited. Um, the election of 1800 is a really wild and wacky ride. It's considered one of the most contentious elections in American history. Now, I know I say that like every election, like, oh my God, did you see the election of 1796 between Adams and Jefferson and how dirty it got? Now this one's even worse. And that's basically going to be how it goes. I mean, wait till we get to like 1876. Or have you heard about 2000? Let me tell you about Bush versus Gore. Or what about that 2016 mess? It seems like American politics is always very divisive, very ugly. And that is something that has not changed since practically the beginning of our country. And I hope you see that right there under Washington's cabinet. Remember how ugly it started with the rift between Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson and the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. That's where it all went down. And you could say it even went down before that with the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists and, and so on and so forth. But the point is, the election of 1800 was nasty. And um, let's go into like the sides. Uh, you have sitting president, a presumably Federalist, but a man who is really without a party to back him John Adams of Massachusetts. Now remember his presidency has been pretty rough. Uh, he doesn't have the nationwide support as the general George Washington did. Instead, Adams is viewed as kind of difficult to work with, contentious, um, and extremely independent. I mean, that was Hamilton's problem with Adams, right? That he couldn't control Adams the way he kind of was able to control Washington to a certain extent. Um, Adams is his own mind and he's gonna speak it. Um, and so John Adams is the Federalist candidate, but the high Federalists, like those Federalists that followed Alexander Hamilton, they're not backing Adams. They're actually backing the VP candidates uh, because at this time there is not the ticket, every man for himself in the Electoral College. And uh, that Federalist being supported by Hamilton was Charles Coatsworth Pickney. Uh, one of our member ambassadors, uh, envoys sent by Adams during the XYZ affair. Uh, so that is on the Federalist side. On the Democratic-Republican side, obviously, the main candidate is the founder of the Democratic-Republican Party himself, Mr. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, former Secretary of State, author of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Vice President of the United States under Adams. He's got a pretty good resume. I think you know the man, right? Um, and the vice presidential candidate under the Democratic Republicans was the New York man, Aaron Burr, sir. Sorry, I've been listening to a lot of Hamilton lately. Um, and so those are the main candidates. And uh, keep in mind that when we talk about the Electoral College, there is a variety of ways in which electors to the Electoral College can be selected. And at this time, it was all over the place. Some of the states are beginning to have, remember that winner take all system, like Virginia in the election of 1800 has the winner take all. They did this to kind of give a few more of those votes over to Jefferson, their native son, where he's from Virginia. Um, and of course, that means that federal states, they need to scramble and kind of follow suit, like what Massachusetts tries to do to get some more federalist votes. Winner take all means that even if only like 51% of the people in your state vote for a certain candidate, all of the electors of that state will go towards that candidate. It's not very democratic, but it is a way for parties to capitalize and get those electors and get their man in the presidency. Um, well, one of the other ways was by percentage of the state legislatures, which is what a lot of the states were doing. Um, and a lot of states moved to that in the election of 1800, where they have their uh, state legislators cast their votes for the electors. And so it was uh, basically split in each state. But what ends up happening is that uh, Adams does really lousy. Remember, because uh, he was without much political support from his own party, the Federalists, since Hamilton was not supporting him. Um, and he's without support, of course, from the Democratic Republicans. They hated him from the beginning. Uh, remember, he had to thread that thin line, uh, trying to keep us out of war with France. We fought the, the, the quasi-war. Uh, remember the XYZ affair. And then remember the backlash uh, where Adams signed into law 
the Alien and Sedition Acts, which really infuriated uh, the Democratic Republicans. Remember, that led to Jefferson and Madison even writing the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, um, you know, calling for nullification and, and leading to ideas eventually of secession later on. Um, and so Adams is very unpopular. He is going to lose the election. But that's not the end of the story. Okay. And, and by the way, same, same thing with 1796. There's lots of mudslinging happening. Remember, that's when you, you throw insults um, at your political opponent. Um, remember, the Federalists, they were being attacked for being monarchists, which is crazy because John Adams was definitely against monarchy. I mean, he was one of our founding fathers. He was a big believer in truth, justice, and the American way. He helped to make the American way. He was like one of the editors of the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson wrote, in fact. Remember, these guys go way back. They're, they're good friends, but now they're being uh, kind of put together as bitter enemies. In fact, Abigail was very mad at Thomas Jefferson. She wouldn't even speak to him for years. Um, but anyway, yeah, people are calling, you know, Adams fat as they have been bald and toothless and uh, unscrupulous Adams, monarchist Adams, elitist Adams. Uh, but the main thing is he just doesn't have a party stand on. He's going to lose. Uh, for Jefferson, uh, remember, there is this these nasty rumors going around that he's an atheist. Remember, because of his deist leanings. Atheist is someone who does not believe in God. And this is a God-fearing nation founded on Christian Protestant uh, principles. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, remember, his Jeffersonian Bible was all of the myths and revelations of the Bible stripped down to just the teachings of Jesus. Jefferson is not your, your traditional Christian, although he identifies as Christian. So they were, they were kind of attacking him for, for being atheist or deist. Uh, they were also attacking Thomas Jefferson uh, for rumors of a sexual nature, that he was basically having uh, an affair with one of his slaves. Uh, the slave's name was Sally, Sally Hemings. Now, I want to go into the Hemings affair just briefly. Uh, I might mention it later because uh, it is a really big deal. Jefferson is a man of great contradictions. You know, most Americans really admire Thomas Jefferson. I mean, he has a giant statue and memorial uh, right opposite uh, the Washington Monument and the White House there in Washington, D.C., um, he's immortalized forever by the words he wrote down in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yet, as far as contradictions and hypocrisy go, I mean, everybody knows that Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. He had a big plantation in Monticello in Virginia. Um, and so there's not only that contradiction to Jefferson, because he's a man that, you know, in most of his writings, uh, he said that slavery was abhorrent, meaning he thought slavery was evil, yet he owned slaves. So it didn't seem to be evil enough to stop him from doing it. Uh, so I guess he could keep his plantation and keep making money. Um, in fact, he's gonna preside uh, during his presidency over the end of the slave trade, uh, something that he had wanted included into our new government. Um, so there's that contradiction. But then as far as, as this affair goes, um, Jefferson's wife, her name was uh, Martha uh, Jefferson, same, same first name as, as Washington's wife. Martha was a very common name at this time. Uh, she had died. Um, they, they had several children together. Uh, Jefferson had daughters, um, so he already had children. Uh, but Martha Jefferson dies, and on her deathbed, she made Thomas Jefferson promise her husband that he would never marry again. And Jefferson will remain a widower, true to his word to his de you know, dying wife for the rest of his life. He'll never remarry. But he does get it on with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings. And the thing is, Sally was actually related to Jefferson's dead wife. She was, she was Martha Jefferson's half-sister. They had the same father. Um, and so this is where we get into the very uncomfortable topic, uh, but very relevant that it was often the case that slave masters would sleep with their slave women. Now, whether that's consensual, the slave woman agreeing to sleep with the slave master, or whether it was rape, does not matter because the slave master is in a position of authority over that woman, and she has no choice in the matter whatsoever, regardless of if she wants to consent to that or not. So that's a very dubious, very disgusting sort of affair. And this is something that Jefferson 
has with Sally Hemings. It's proven through DNA, through the descendants that they had. Four of the children that Jefferson and Sally Hemings had lived to adulthood. Um, they were like, I mean, Sally Hemings, she's already a mixed race. Her father was a white plantation owner. Uh, her mother was a mulatto woman, um, a slave who was already of mixed race. So the children of Jefferson and the slave woman, Sally Hemings, they were like seven eighths white and one eighth African American. Three of the four uh, children, they actually integrated into white society in, in Virginia legally. Um, and one of them remained um, in African society, even though uh, slavery passes down through the female line. So technically they were born as slaves, uh, but they were freed. Um, and their descendants today, they, they had DNA testing done, I think it was in the 1990s, that conclusively proved that they were the direct descendants of Thomas Jefferson. <clears throat> now, all of this gets uh, revealed in about 1801, 1802, um, uh, when Jefferson is kind of taking office. And this is because, <clears throat> excuse me, Jefferson had promised one of the main uh, hatchet men for the Democratic Republican Party, the newspaper editor, James Callender. Do you remember when we mentioned him before? Okay, let me remind you. The Alien and Sedition Acts, remember under Adams, this was targeting uh, Republicans, this was targeting French supporters during the Quasi War. James Callender, one of the main Democratic Republican newspaper writers in America, he gets imprisoned under the Sedition Acts for basically criticizing John Adams and the Federalists in Congress. So he's put in prison under the Sedition Act. Well, Thomas Jefferson is going to pardon him, and James Callender was basically led to believe that he was supposed to get a big position in Jefferson's new presidential administration. He believed, Callender, that he would be made the postmaster general of the United States under Jefferson's presidency. Well, that does not happen. In fact, you know, Thomas Jefferson, he is a believer in patronage, but he doesn't go as far as like the full on spoil system. Like he gets the idea of loyalty much better than John Adams. Adams was maybe too rigid in his principles. Jefferson is a master politician, better than Washington. Like Jefferson knows how to wheel and deal. He's very charming. He knows how to make those backroom deals and everything else. Um, and he knows how to get the best loyalty out of his people, but he also has principles. And Jefferson does not believe in blindly just giving followers positions just because. So Jefferson denies Calendar the position of Postmaster General, and Calendar retaliates by starting to print these rumors about the affair with the slave Sally Hemming. So that's when it starts to come out at the beginning of Jefferson's presidency. And Thomas Jefferson, for his part, he doesn't really say anything. He just kind of keeps quiet on the subject and never really addresses it. And, and to that extent, it kind of goes away. And again, that's, that's a master political tactic right there. Basically, don't comment on it and don't feed the, the news story because the more you say on something, the more it becomes a bigger deal, right? Versus if you just kind of wash over it and just move on to the next thing, people kind of forget it. Um, and so that's, that's sort of what happens. Um, now, there's another big uh, sex scandal that had happened a few years before this, actually the, considered the very first sex scandal in American history revolving around none other than Alexander Hamilton himself. It was called the Reynolds Affair. And uh, Hamilton had actually had this affair. Um, he was married, unlike Jefferson. Um, Hamilton had had this affair uh, with uh, a woman named, uh, what was it? Mar I want to call every woman at this time Martha now for some reason, <laughs> uh, but uh, Miss, Miss Reynolds, Mariah, it was Mariah, Mariah Reynolds in 1791, 1792, uh, this is at the beginning of George Washington's presidency, uh, had approached Hamilton uh, in his house in New York uh, that she was desperate and out of money and that her husband had abused her and left her and she was destitute. Oh, please, Hamilton, will you save me? You know, oh, please. And so Hamilton goes to her and offers some money and then she lures poor Hamilton into her bed, this temptress, this is Hamilton's side of the story, of course. Um, and they begin having this affair that actually is going to continue for several years. Well, what happens is that the husband not only finds out, but like he lets the affair continue. Now, normally during this time, if your honor is slighted, you say, I demand a duel for my honor, sir. 
we're going to get into Jackson and talk all about duels. But we got to talk a little bit about duels because Alexander Hamilton's going to be involved in a pretty famous one, just coming right up. Um, but Mr. Reynolds actually does not demand a duel because this was the Secretary of the Treasury, one of the most important, you know, men in America. Instead, he demands uh, some bribery money. This is blackmail. This is blackmail. Um, basically saying that he will not reveal the affair if Hamilton pays him and pays him like a lot of money. Hamilton paid over $1,300 to the Reynolds and the wife turns out was in on it too. She wrote letters to Hamilton begging him to continue the affair, knowing that her husband was blackmailing him while it was happening. Um, so, and $1,300 back then, I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars today uh, for hush money to, to keep it quiet. But eventually uh, the rumors swirl. And in uh, 1797, this is uh, during Adam's presidency, um, several of the government officials, including uh, Democratic Republican strongman and future president of the United States, James Monroe, he'd been a soldier during the American Revolution, just like Hamilton. He'll be our fifth president. And he was, just like Madison, a devout follower of Thomas Jefferson, who's our rivals with Hamilton. He's part of this group that goes to Hamilton and request uh, information about this affair because what was being asserted was not just that Hamilton was paying uh, money to keep the affair quiet, but also that Hamilton was getting this hush money from the government, which that part, Hamilton is gonna be like, oh, hell no. He's gonna be like, no, 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 no. I might be having, you know, the scootily pooping with this woman, we might be doing the, the, the horizontal tango, but I am not stealing money from the United States government to fund my blackmail. Uh, so what Hamilton does is he actually writes a letter uh, admitting that he had this affair, like, ouch, poor Eliza, his wife, like everybody now is hearing about Hamilton, like basically say that he cheated on his wife. He, he writes this letter, and it gets published everywhere. Uh, but he says he, he vehemently denies taking money from the government to pay for the blackmail. Um, and so Hamilton, uh, you know, after, after Washington, Hamilton is retired and he's in disgrace under Adams. And that's where he finds himself now during the election of 1800, just trying to quietly pick up the pieces of his family and his life uh, in New York City. Um, so those are the, the sex scandals you should be aware of. They're kind of having a big impact on America at this time. Um, and New York does become pretty important in the election of 1800. You know, all, all this is circulating about Jefferson. You have Aaron Burr, the vice presidential candidate of the Democratic Republicans in New York, doing something relatively crazy. He's canvassing for votes. And what that means is he's actually campaigning like politicians do today. Like he, the candidate for president, is going out, shaking hands, kissing babies, talking to people and asking them to vote for him. Now you might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound that radical, actually. Isn't that what everybody did? Oh, no. Remember Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, they didn't actually campaign for themselves. They had their people campaign for them. It was seen as too lowly for you to go out and beg for votes, like some sort of commoner or something. So um, they all kind of look down on Aaron Burr for doing this, for, for being, you know, resorting to, to begging for votes, basically. Um, but that's the future of campaigns. That's the future of how to get votes. Um, okay, and so in the Electoral College, uh, Adams loses. The Democratic Republicans, they have, uh, they have the votes. And um, it should be a simple matter. But when the electors go to vote, at this time, uh, under the Constitution, every elector got two votes, one for, you know, president and, well, it, it wasn't for president or vice president, um, they just had two votes. And basically, um, the person with the most votes would become the president, and the person with the second highest number of votes would become the vice president. And so the Democratic Republicans, uh, they were supposed to have a deal where they would have one person uh, vote uh, for somebody else instead of Aaron Burr. So that Jefferson would have one more vote for Aaron Burr, even though they were both the Democratic Republicans. 
but that plan fell through. It did not go down as they had planned. And it turns out there was a tie in the Electoral College on the Democrat Republican side. Both Republican candidates, Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr, both got 73 electoral votes. They tied. Now, when there's a tie in the Electoral College like this, under the Constitution and Article 2, it's supposed to go to the House of Representatives, to Congress. And the House is supposed to be the tiebreaker. Now, here's the deal. This is where it gets real messy. This is where we're going to circle back to Alexander Hamilton. See, there's also, while presidents are being elected, there's lots of other elections that happen. And we talked about like midterm elections every two years, you know, the House of Representatives, they get reelected or they get voted out. Uh, that's the congressional elections. So in the congressional elections in uh, 1800, Democrat Republicans won big, probably because everybody hated the Alien and Sedition Act so much. Uh, remember, that was done by the Federalist in Congress. The Federalist had won really big in the midterm elections of 1798. People hated those laws so much that in the next election now, they vote really big Democratic Republican. And uh, Congress is going to change. But Congress doesn't get sworn in until the following year. Same thing for the president, 1801. So the Congress that is going to be deciding who gets to become the next president is the old Congress. The new one hasn't been sworn in yet. And the old Congress, who are they? Those are those Federalists who were elected back in 1798. Now, this is a phenomenon that we actually have a term for. It's called a lame duck Congress. It means that these are the outgoing congressmen who have lost their jobs and are basically going to be going back to their congressional districts. They've lost, but they're still there just hanging on to office for a few more months until the new people get sworn in. And they're still technically congressmen. So that's what's going on. This lame duck Congress made up of mostly Federalist members is gonna have to decide between the tiebreaker who will be the next president. And it's kind of weird, right? Like they hate both of these guys a lot. They have the two choices are both Democratic Republicans. They can either choose Thomas Jefferson, who is the leader of the Democratic Republican Party, or they could choose Aaron Burr. Now let's think who is the kind of de facto leader of the Federalists that they might listen to. Alexander Hamilton, back in New York, trying to lay low because the Reynolds affair and everything else. The high Federalists, the House of Representatives, they turn kind of to Hamilton for his advice. And Hamilton says, choose Jefferson. Everybody's like, what? What? Are you kidding? You hate Jefferson. You literally started the first party system because of how much you two fight, like cats and dogs. And you say, choose Jefferson? And Hamilton says, yeah, I might not agree with hardly anything that Jefferson believes in. He's a Francophile. You know, I like the British system. He's in favor of an agrarian, you know, yeoman farmer class. Uh, I'm in favor of business and banks and, and, merc and uh, oh gosh, uh, manufacturing, sorry, industrialism and all this, you know, very different visions of America. Remember Hamilton's financial plan totally divided the cabinet. Uh, but in the end, Hamilton says, Jefferson has principles. Jefferson has beliefs. Burr is just a slick and slimy politician who will say and do whatever he needs to to get to power. So Hamilton, he doesn't think much of Burr at all. He says, support Jefferson. And that's what the House does. They back Jefferson. Jefferson becomes the president. And then the second place guy, Aaron Burr, now is the vice president, and he is not very happy with Alexander Hamilton. That will, of course, lead to the duel a few years later, 1804. Vice President of the United States Aaron Burr will famously shoot and kill former Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton in a duel in New Jersey, 1804. Okay, so that is the election of 1800. Um, that is a crazy and wild ride, but there you go. So now Thomas Jefferson is president. And first thing that they're going to work on is fixing it to where you don't have a president and a vice president that are enemies, because that's crazy and that does not make sense. Remember, that first happened in 1796 with Adams becoming the president, a presumable Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson, the Democratic Republican, becoming the vice president. So... 
Congress is going to propose, and the states, remember under the Fifth Amendment, or sorry, Fifth Article to the Constitution, the states will pass the Twelfth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And that creates what we call the ticket. There's President Obama and Vice President uh, Joe Biden in 2008 when uh, Obama was elected. The ticket is that the president and vice president run together instead of each man running on their own and then the first place person becoming president, the second place person becoming VP. They get rid of that and they just say, hey, you're going to have like your team with a designated person for president and a designated person for vice president running against the other teams. And that's how it now works in the electoral college system. And that way we avoid having political enemies as pres and VP. Uh, Jefferson in March of 1801 takes office. And this is the reason we call the election of 1800, the revolution of 1800 is because for the first time since the country began under the constitution, uh, since 1789, you have a transfer of power between two political parties, between opponents, and it was done peacefully. There was no bloodshed. Our system proved that it could work. A peaceful transference of power occurred. So that's, that's why this is known as the Revolution of 1800. Um, this was a bold experiment, remember? Most European countries had had monarchies where power passed from uh, father to son, father to son. Here we had elections deciding who the next leader would be. And from Washington to Adams, that wasn't a big deal because they were both sort of the same, you know, Federalist. Um, but Thomas Jefferson was a political opponent to them. He criticized Washington. He definitely criticized and belittled Adams. And here he is taking over and it was done peacefully. But the first thing that Jefferson, the master politician does is in his inaugural address, his first speech after swearing an oath of office to the constitution, to the presidency, uh, he gives a speech where he, and you know, it's just like Washington's farewell address. Uh, it will be mostly read by people on, in newspapers um, at this time. Jefferson does deliver the speech though in the Senate chamber um, in Washington, DC. The city was just freshly built. Uh, Jefferson will be the first president to actually get to move in and live in the White House. Um, but uh, he was so soft-spoken, he was so quiet, it was hard for people to hear him. Uh, so most people are gonna read this in their newspapers. But it was a very famous speech where he starts off by saying, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. It's a call for unity. Just like Washington's farewell address, you know, Jefferson is taking a page out of Washington's book saying, you know, we got to unify. We're all Americans. We're all in this together, trying to, trying to bring back that positive image, even though Jefferson himself had been the one to kind of start a lot of the ugly divisiveness. Um, one other thing that Jefferson is going to do early on that's going to set a more moderate approach to what many were expecting to be a very, a very radical transformation is that he doesn't immediately like fire all of Adams' uh, government's employees. Most of the government's uh, office holders um, well, and, and uh, officials, uh, they get to keep their jobs, especially the lower ranks. Jefferson mainly just changes out the people that were in, in higher positions. Um, so he, he's kind of taking a more moderate approach now that he's governing, actually, instead of being on the outside. Um, he will set for his Secretary of State, of course, his, his best friend, his hatchet man, James Madison, will be Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State. And that's significant because uh, Jefferson, remember, himself had started off as Washington's Secretary of State. And moving forward, you're going to see that that Secretary of State position is sort of kind of an indicator of who the president wants to be his next, you know, his successor, the next president. Because from Thomas Jefferson, the next president will be James Madison. And then Madison chooses for his Secretary of State, James Monroe. And James Monroe chooses for his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, who will be the next president. Um, and then we get into some, uh, some, some difficulties and the next party system. Uh, but that, that's going to be a key thing. Um, let's see, as far as policy decisions, uh, Jefferson is going to undo a few of the, the big things, uh, but keep others. He is definitely going to uh, have his Congress, his Democrat Republican Congress, uh, repeal the whiskey tax. They get rid of it, just as his followers wanted. 
Um, he's also going to lower taxes, doing his part to help the smaller, you know, yeoman, farmer, frontiersman Americans. Jefferson, even though he is an elitist, he's, you know, a Francophile, he's very well read, academic, scholarly guy who owns his big plantation with slaves in Monticello, very fancy and rich and everything else, although he was heavily indebted. Um, he is seen as more of a champion for the common man than like Adams or Washington had been. You know, that's who Jefferson wants to try to help. He's not about those banks or the businessmen or the merchants. Um, so he will do things like that to help them. Um, also, of course, Congress is going to immediately repeal the Alien and Sedition Acts uh, under uh, Jefferson, except for the Alien uh, Enemies Act. Remember, that one is still in the books. He did understand patronage, but remember, he doesn't fully commit to the spoil system. We won't have a president that fully commits to the spoil system. That means like just giving jobs to whoever your loyal followers are, regardless of if they are qualified for the job or not. We won't have a president that goes that far until Andrew Jackson. Now, as far as like what Jefferson's White House was like, and now we actually have the White House in, in Washington, D.C. It wasn't called that yet. It was actually painted a different color. It won't be painted white until after the War of 1812 when it gets burned down. Um, Jefferson was very informal. In fact, he actually like very humbly looking, he walks to his inauguration. Um, he doesn't take a carriage. He dresses sort of shabbily and like wears slippers when he greets guests at the, at the White House. Um, remember, Jefferson is also a widower. His wife, Martha, had died. Um, so Jefferson does not have a first lady. Um, his daughters will kind of assume that role in greeting guests and hosting parties. But for most of those hostessing duties, Jefferson will heavily rely on his best friend, James Madison's wife, Dolly Madison. Dolly was incredibly vivacious, very short, like energetic, amazingly charming woman, wore all the beautiful, most modern dresses from Paris of the day. Um, everybody loved her and she loved everybody. And she was just the hostess with the mostess, as my dad would say. Um, and she will be helping Jefferson to kind of host a bunch of functions at the White House since he didn't have his own first lady. She was dead. Um, so that's Dolly Madison, um, James Madison's wife. And basically our longest serving first lady next to Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, because of his informal style, he does ruffle some feathers, particularly with a very uptight and kind of snobby ambassador from England, um, Anthony Mary. Now, uh, the British ambassador, Anthony Mary and his wife, uh, when he first gets greeted by Jefferson in the middle of the night with slippers and stuff, you know, waiting his commission, he's horrified. And it only gets worse from there. Jefferson invites the Marys to a, uh, an informal dinner at the White House in his very French salon there. And who should be next to the Marys but the French ambassador, while England and France are literally at war with each other. Mary points out to Secretary of State James Madison, like, hey, are you trying to, you know, make me mad? Like, what are you doing putting me in dinner with the French? I hate them. Like, what's your problem, guys? What's your problem, America? Does Jefferson hate me? Madison's like, eh, we don't care. Deal with it. He basically, Madison says, deal with it, Mary. We could care less if we hurt your feelings. Because remember, Jefferson is a Francophile. He's leaning more towards France. He really doesn't like the British. Um, and so Mary, um, actually, after the... Um, the murder, the duel and the killing, I should say, of Alexander Hamilton at the hands of Vice President Aaron Burr, uh, Anthony Mary, the British ambassador and Aaron Burr will kind of plot to uh, have several states in the Western part of the country like Ohio and, and even Louisiana break away from the United States uh, with British support and like have a, a civil war basically. Um, now, Britain will eventually wise up and replace Mary, and of course, uh, Aaron Burr will eventually face trial for treason uh, after, after all this, but yeah, it was, it was interesting. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about in our lecture today is a very important thing that happens right at the beginning of Jefferson's presidency, and it has to do with the courts and the Third Amendment, you know, the judicial branch. Um, basically, John Adams, right before leaving office, is going to appoint several dozen new Federalist judges 
to um, federal courts. These federal courts, like appellate courts, um, that's that's where you uh, a judge hears a case and then something went wrong with the case and it needs to be heard again. It goes to an appellate court, an appeals court. Um, but uh, these these several dozen new positions to federal courts um, were created by the uh, the Federal Judiciary Act of 1781, which is amendment of the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789. It created the the lower courts. Um, and that's what this is all about. And Adams appointments, um, he's doing this with his lame duck Congress that's mostly these Federalists. So they're appointing Federalist judges. Remember, judges serve for life. So this is a big deal and Democratic Republicans do not like this. When Jefferson takes office in March, he is going to refuse to give the commendations to any of these remaining judges that have not yet received them, basically says, well, Adams was the one that gave you that. I am not doing that. And he tells his Secretary of State, James Madison, not to deliver the commissions, uh, the formal, you know, orders like, hey, you got this job. You, you, you're now a judge. Um, and so Madison will refuse to give these. Now, one of the federal judges, a guy named William Marbury, is going to sue the government, specifically sue James Madison, whose job it was to deliver the commission for failing to do so. He says, hey, I was supposed to get this job. It was assured to me, you can't withhold it. Um, and this is going to be a really big deal. This is going to become the Supreme Court case of Marbury versus Madison. So William Marbury, he's one of these Federalist judges that was appointed by John Adams right at the end of Adams' presidency, right before Jefferson comes into office. Jefferson refuses to give him the job, withholds his papers. Remember, it's Madison whose job it was to officially deliver the papers. They refuse to do that and they get sued. This becomes this case. Um, by the way, those judges that were appointed last minute, the Federalist judges, they're called the midnight appointments or the midnight judges. So that's what Marbury is. Um, and so in this case, we have a, by the way, in early 1801, um, the, uh, the Senate hearings finally confirmed a new chief justice to the Supreme Court. Really big deal. This is the big Federalist who's going to be um, in office forever, John Marshall. So John Marshall, king of Federalists, is the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And his Supreme Court is overhearing this case. Now think about that. Okay, Marbury is a Federalist judge saying he should be commissioned. James Madison represents, you know, the Democratic Republican Party that he helped found with Thomas Jefferson. Who do you think John Marshall's going to support? Right? The Federalists. But not so fast. John Marshall is incredibly smart. Give him some credit here because what he's going to do is going to change forever the system of checks and balances in the United States, and it's going to give the power of judicial review, the power to interpret the law of this country to the Supreme Court. So let's see how he does that. First off, you ask yourself a couple questions about this case, Marshall says. First off, does William Arbery, is he supposed to get his commission, yes or no? And Marshall says, his Supreme Court is going to say, yes, he was supposed to get his commission. It was guaranteed by the Judiciary Act of 1781. He was appointed by the president, confirmed by the lame duck uh, Federalist Congress. He should be commissioned. Second question is, was it right that Congress was able to commission him? And this one's a little less clear, but Mar uh, Marshall basically says, um, yes, they have the right. They approved him. And then finally, does the Supreme Court have the power to hear this case? And for that last question, Marshall actually says, uh, no, hold the front door. We can't actually say and demand and order Secretary of State James Madison to deliver the commission because the Supreme Court does not have that power. That is not a power given to the Supreme Court in the Constitution in Article 3. Article 3 does spell out the cases that the Supreme Court hear and the powers that it can have, and it does not mention anything about, you know, ordering the commission of federal judges. So what Marshall, in a sense, has done is he's basically decided what the Constitution meant by those words. 
and he's given this power to decide what the Constitution means to his court, the Supreme Court of the United States. He's established judicial review, the power to interpret the Constitution, which is huge. Um, that is like most of the cases that the Supreme Court hears today. They're about judicial review. They're about deciding what is and is not legal according to the Constitution. And so that is, that is why Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court case from 1803, is probably the most important Supreme Court case of them all. Now, there's, there's other huge landmark, as we call them, uh, very important Supreme Court cases. You think of like uh, Brown versus Board of Education that basically ruled that kids of all colors could go to the same schools or Loving versus Virginia that said couples of, of different races could legally get married anywhere in the United States. There's been huge Supreme Court cases, but none of them would have ever happened were it not for Marbury versus Madison, which established, once again, you notice I'm saying it a lot because it's really important, judicial review, the power to interpret the Constitution. And by the way, John Marshall, he's going to be there as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, kind of, you know, spewing his Federalist dogma for, like I said, a long time. He lives until 78 years old, and justices on the Supreme Court, they serve for life or until they retire. Um, and so he will be there for a long time until, like, Andrew Jackson's presidency, um, basically keeping with uh, the ideas of the Federalist Party, even long after the Federalist Party ceases to be. Okay, we will stop there. Thank you guys so much. Uh, when we pick up our next lecture, we'll talk about uh, some of the other very important things in Thomas Jefferson's presidency, and we'll close it out. Uh, but yes, we will definitely be talking about the Louisiana Purchase next time and the expedition of Lewis and Clark and a Native American woman named Sacagawea. Thank you guys, bye.